Knock, knock. Branch prediction. Who's there? This is Podkit, episode 35, Meltdown Lake, on Thursday, January 4th, 2017. And now, already 10% slower. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rambersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk35. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hello. We are back. Happy New yes, Year. And happy New Year. New happy Year. Happy holidays. New Year, new podcast. Yes, this time 35. Whew. Some stuff has happened. Uh, some pretty big stuff has happened in uh, the uh, the area that this pod- podcast kind of strives to, uh, to cover. Uh, one of the biggest things happened in the past uh, 24 to 48 hours, which is two rather core uh, vulnerabilities in basically every computer made in the past 20 years. Is that, is that fair to say, 20 years? Yep. Something like that? Since 1995. Uh, wow. Yep. A small, a small uh, attack surface there. Jeez, that means that uh, for as long as I've been alive, there have not been made any computers, well... Most computers uh, do not, uh, or are, are, are all kind of subject to these vulnerabilities that were recently released. I wonder if my uh, Power Mac G5 sitting in my attic will be patched. You know, that is a good <laughs> point. I wonder, I wonder if Power PC computers had that issue. Um, I saw that Power 9 is the IBM architecture it's that they still support. So, and I'm assuming the Power PC yeah. is, as well. Okay, yeah. well. So we should probably mention what those things are, uh, what this, nah. what 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 actually happened. Oh right, man, so, it's so strange. So we're talking about Meltdown Inspector, two extremely low-level vulnerabilities um, that have to do basically with uh, memory address randomization, among other things. Um, the 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 short version is basically that um, it. The, the thing that your processor does to help combat buffer overflows, um, the thing that um, everything from the processor on up into user space does to prevent buffer overflows, um, is pretty pretty fundamentally broken. Uh, is that fair to say you, you both think? Yep. Yeah, I've more read about the um, branch prediction uh, bug. I'm not sure which one that is, because there are two here. One that is patchable with an supposedly up to 30 percent performance hit if you choose to protect against that and the other one is so low level and built into the the core way that these architectures work that they can't be patched at all they they just need a redesign um and so this branch prediction one is an optimization that the cpu does when running through repeated tasks it will uh predict based on uh previous cache and other data that it stores predict what will be happening so it will pre-compute that before it even runs the condition to see if that's what's going to be computed so these are optimizations that cpus have added over the years to become faster and support that nice uh increase in processor speed that we so much loved for the last several decades this means that some clever researchers i don't know I think it was two independent sources. I don't remember where. Google did a bunch of the work. Yeah, yeah. a bunch of folks with Google Project Zero, uh, some folks from various universities and other kind of uh, independent security firms were all involved in uh, discovering uh, this uh, th- these two vulnerabilities. Yeah. So these, these clever researchers uh, figured out that there's a way to to use this branch prediction as a way to um, arbitrarily execute code or not execute code or uh, what is it? Uh, Ar- read or write from kernel memory. Yeah. And yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the biggest kind of red flag here is um, it, it, these vulnerabilities can allow an attacker to read from a uh, very like extremely privileged uh, memory addresses that they should, that they have no business accessing. 
um that, that's kind of that's kind of the biggest uh the biggest thing that these uh vulnerabilities uh kind of the core of what they what the problems they cause um because if you can read that memory then uh that that's that's one thing that's all that's one thing to exfiltrate it and to write from it is uh, something entirely different uh and entirely almost more frightening because uh not only you know all, all the information that that's in that memory is accessible to other people which could include something super mundane like you know overhead for computing some something uh or something super uh sensitive like somebody's password or identifying information or data but writing to it means that there's like extremely undetectable propensity for like corruption right like corruption of data so um to you know whether that's causing random crashes that who knows why they happen uh or you know overwriting something that's currently being you know computed um these things can have ripple effects uh throughout you know the rest of the way that you use your computer uh i don't know do you have you all heard of anything anyone using these out in the wild yet i remembered that this vulnerability was very under wraps um yeah, I think Google first reported it in like June or July this summer. Right. And it was originally going to be publicly released next week, but it was done earlier for some reason. Because everybody leaked it because it was too good of a story to pass up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, so I haven't heard of anything in the wild, but there are some proof of concepts here. So on the specterattack.com website, which details a lot of information about this, uh, they have a video that is an example of running a command in your terminal and then typing a password in like a password manager or some password box in a completely separate application. And it just logs right there in the terminal. And so that's clearly a privilege escalation there. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, I mean, I think with, you know, a bug this large, it is pretty low level. Um, now I did see some things about being able to execute this from JavaScript as well. Oh <laughs> man, that is so cool. Oh Using God. The shared array buffer that is yeah i think edge shipped it i think most of the browsers shipped it this fall so i think that's being locked down or even disabled in browsers uh there's a new chrome had some benchmarking thing that was reducing its accuracy from 5 to 20 milliseconds for some reason about this that might be related to the shared array buffers and that's you know that's scary you don't <laughs> escaping Going from JavaScript to kernel memory is gigantic. You know, the browser is supposed to be one of the most sandboxed environments. Yeah. I think on a neat computer. So having this, you know, even without a JavaScript bug or a, an issue that affects JavaScript, it's a huge thing. But then you add in any web browser as well. And it's just, it's like the, the end all. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I heard somewhere else too, um, that there's a like a variant of this attack that you can execute um simply using like a cross site um get request i'm trying to find like the source oh, of it that. was it was a json file in the source of an image i think oh jeez, yeah something it's like that it's absolutely bizarre um I'm, I'm trying to track down like where i saw that but i can't i can't seem to find it readily here it'll go in the show notes if i track it down but um, there, there's some, uh, there are definitely some uh, JavaScript-based attacks that are uh, described in the uh, paper for uh, for Spectre here. Yeah. So these, some of these JavaScript. I mean, you don't typically you don't think of JavaScript as having privileged access to really anything on your host machine. Right. It's sort of a sandbox in that way, um, but it just goes to show that. Even if the sandbox is, in fact, on the same system, there's still a way to get out of the sandbox somehow. somehow. Uh Um, But it it really just is a simple array that you can just break out of. It's really cool. Yep. Cool is definitely one word for it. (laughs) (laughs) And the... um... The other effects about about this, too, I think that's worth discussing a little bit is, um, you know, to patch this that a lot of vendors have released patches for can be an up to 30 percent performance impact Mm -hmm. or maybe more realistically 10 percent or something. That's still huge. You know, 
if you're running your your whole company on EC2 and you suddenly need to increase your um, your server that you're using to get more performance to do what you were doing before that already. Yep. That's going to hurt. And I think Microsoft, their patch won't be enabled by default. So you can enable it if you want in the registry. And, you know, it's more, it's mostly there for machines that are running untrusted code. So right. a VM host, so you don't have machines running on that host dealing with memory in other machines. Right. Yeah, so I have some mixed feelings about the the performance loss. So, you know, there, you know, in the first day or two of this, you know, everybody was going crazy about thirty percent performance loss. Yeah. But then, you know, somebody actually read through what was happening and, you know, maybe calmed down a little bit. And so now it's you know between five and thirty percent. So, I think we'll actually have to end up seeing what effect it actually um, brings to a regular user. Uh, somebody was running. On iOS, the performance benchmarks with uh, Geekbench 4, and yeah. they didn't notice mm-hmm. anything noticeable. Yeah. But, you know, benchmarks. I Yeah, I definitely think it depends on the type of computation you're doing on that machine, uh, as well as what kind of activity, what OS you're running, what software you're running. It would be really interesting to see, though, if for some reason uh, ARM processors like those in an iPhone or an iPad uh have kind of like a different sort of reaction because they they do use a different instruction set um, apparently even ios was vulnerable even on the a chip oh totally totally so like the the vulnerability is one thing but i'm but the performance uh oh the like, performance like the, degradation the right sure yeah yeah right i'm, I'm trying to, i'm trying to remember my uh operating systems class or my uh machine yeah. architecture class mm-hmm. and like I, I know we talked about arm and like risk um reduced instruction set computers um and like what the distinction is there because there is there is like a hardware difference there in in what um how some of these things work um yep. but they all definitely kind of you know come from the same line of thinking so i you know that, that they're vulnerable as well doesn't surprise me but i'm wondering if there'd be some difference in the in the performance that that said to you like ios is just such a different kind of place to do the active computing that right. i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if um the that also had effects on it that's that's one of the things that's so kind of freaky about all this is that um you know this is kind of uh shaking the bedrock of computing right of modern right. modern computers so like to attribute any particular effect uh, to it can be kind of difficult, or to or to figure out why one thing would react, one one platform or one architecture would react differently than another is kind of um, th- there's a lot tied up in that. It's hard to hard to draw a correlation. I wonder if we're going to see any new types of attacks. You know, if this is opening the door to different ways of approaching vulnerabilities on a processor you know are there are we going to see other things like this in the future because i th- i don't think people have seen a, a branch prediction exploit like this much before no not at all and so it's kind of like people might be you know thinking oh we could try this try that yeah i think that is a a, a big factor so you know most people think of uh, viruses or trojans or i don't know whatever those other things are malware i guess were um, yeah you know, you, you, yeah, yeah, this is exactly. You, so you sort of think of those si- sort of siloed into an operating system level. So, right. you know, you can get a virus on your Windows computer and, you know, maybe you can get a virus on your Mac under super strange circumstances. And, of course, on Android, if you uh, look at your phone, it has a virus. Um, so I think people will think about that kind of thing, but this is far deeper than that, and that's what's so strange about it. Uh, you know, uh I I could have never imagined that there would be a chip level, not even chip level, an implementation level flaw in chips such that you can't change them ever again after that would be so profound. Like, it's just right. amazing to me. So, like, I, I remember I had a professor that made a joke that, like, oh, well, the, you know, the reason why people don't find these any, anymore is that nobody cares about designing hardware. Um, uh, well, I, th- I think, uh, you know... This, 
this either proved him right or proved him wrong perhaps both um because you know we're probably at a point now where um certainly intel and amd and many other companies uh are pretty strongly rethinking a lot of these uh uh closely held or, or, or strongly held kind of uh beliefs and assumptions about why certain you know architecture level implementations of things are the way they are mm-hmm. um and it, it's all it's all going to have to be looked at more closely as a result of this and i think we'll hopefully be better for it in the future so that that brings up a great question so since both of these issues are related to the actual chips implementing poor implementations what do you think the OEM, so AMD, Intel, uh, ARM, but not really ARM, whoever you yeah, know, buys whoever, the ARM template? Yeah. So, like, what do you think those actors will do? Do you think they'll actually update their actual chips, you know, any time in the near term, or will this be a five year fix? Oh yeah, I'd have to imagine it's going to be like a five year. That's what I was thinking too. Thing like there's there's no way they can get something out there in time. Yeah, it's gonna be you know new generation, probably not new architect. Like we're not gonna get rid of AMD sixty four for example, but um, yeah, I think a few, couple of years if it's that low level, if they have to really change how, like, is this like a hardware level kind of implementation failure somewhat? Right. Yeah, I don't know. So a, a little bit of Brandon's PR corner here. I think they're gonna have to. <laughs> I think they're gonna have to call it a new architecture. It might use the exact same assembly language, but I can't imagine that you know, um, to explain this to regular people, regular people like the you know the folks who texted you know, I'm sure many of us like, um, in the aftermath of hearing about this on the news or whatever, um. To, to be like, wait, am I affected by this? And it's like, yes, you're affected by this. Everyone's affected by this. You know, but but on the news, especially with tech stuff, especially as of late, you know, you look at Equifax, on the news and everywhere, are you affected by this? Yes, you're affected by this. Go do something about it. Nah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I yeah, I wonder is, you know, if, it, if a new architecture is warranted for fixing this, is that going to happen? It might just be, eh, this is a an issue with what we have today but work around it It doesn't affect too many people it's hard to do kind of the cost of doing business that's fair i i and i think that's how it is yeah cost of doing business for sure you have to know yes you could read anything but there's so much memory today you you can't just easily say oh grab the password in this arbitrarily executing code like you you know you have to do some research to figure out how to access something so it's not well, like, that's true of the vulnerability but it also is bad that the solution to the vulnerability is to reduce performance by some percentage. Yeah. Right. Um, and then to have to to live with that for another 10, 15 years until somebody can make a mechanism to transition Windows and OS X and iOS and Android or, and whatever else happens between then to yeah. a new architecture template format. I don't know the details. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wonder if, you know, just... The performance impact will be taken now, but in a couple of years with new CPUs coming out, they'll make it up again. And, you know, 10 years from now, if it's the same stuff still around, they're still going right. to be faster. Probably, but. I hope. <laughs> so, you know, for now, it could just be a minor setback for the next year or two until, uh, what, Coffee Lake and then whatever one's after uh, that comes Meltdown out. Meltdown you know, Lake, might be... Spectre Lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, exactly. did either of you guys have to do anything in response to this at work? Uh, I just ran software upgrades on VPSs. That's that good. Was the majority of it. Yeah. Mostly my own VPSs. Um, I don't have like sole ownership over many VPSs at work, which is good. Uh, someone posted an article about it in our Slack at work. Uh, otherwise, that's the only thing I saw. Uh, I know today there was some um, load testing in one of our lower environments, and so they said no one deploy anything there. And I, they didn't mention what they were doing, so I wonder if that was to test the impact of applying mm. these patches. Um, I would imagine it is because it 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 was an integration environment. Right, that's a good good place to try it. 
Yeah, so uh, today we um, we went into our AWS environment and um, we looked at all of our um, Elastic Beanstalk servers and any of them that hadn't been updated in, in the last week, we terminated them all and then re-spawned them. Yeah. Yep. That. that seems yep. solid. Yep. So we did we did what we could. So we'll we'll see. Yep. I did I did see some pretty frightening graphs from folks who had updated their uh, EC2 instances um where they were seeing yeah, like I saw some 10 too. 15% performance hits all the way around, which is uh you know, basically in line with what we were what we've heard. But um, that's like, yeah, as you mentioned, Brian, that's kind of a lot for somebody who's so running do you a lot think, of these instances. Yeah. Do you think that AWS will have a, I don't know, price response in, in regards to that? Like, if they had a certain tier of performance before, I mean, it's not their fault, but it's hard to justify um, losing, you know, 10% of your top level performance overnight. Sure, but like, I guess who's whose cost is that to bear i guess and i i have a feeling amazon would probably say it's well it's the users right it's not like their hardware is worse now well i mean um, their hardware is worse now it, it's an it's it is well yeah but uh you're not paying amazon to uh it, it's it's the kernel that's slower now right basically i mean right. the the hardware is slower but like who installs a kernel you install the kernel right sure um, so i guess if if i chose to i could run an, one of the operating systems that wasn't affected exactly you could totally choose to run a vulnerable kernel if you wish well no um, i mean uh, well right that but, too but you could yeah. also run um i don't know not 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 any operating system that anybody knows about that isn't um well it's not even an operating system issue they're all running intel chips so right. no matter what you do you're you're not going to win just build your own CPU and call it good. And put it in the cloud. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Co-locate it. Yep. That's yep. What you got to do. Each each uh, remote server is one transistor. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. That'd be kind of awesome. Well, I think we've uh, you know clearly this is a big uh, voluminous issue, um, but I think we've we've uh, we've given it certainly fair airtime here uh well, there's one other article i want to point out here from ars technica that had a really solid write-up of um a, a lot of the kind of computing history of behind uh these two flaws um yep. and i think that's uh definitely worth a look out but that's all i have to say about that how about you guys sounds good yeah i'd say uh, check out my twitter i retweeted some stuff some good discussions and threads about more details i could link that too i'll do that nice Sounds rather good. than just talk about it i'll help the, the listener hey listener yes. uh so our next uh kind of item of news here is the imac pro uh this kind of came in a little bit under the radar at least uh fr- from my perspective here yeah i agree with you uh all, all of a sudden we just started hearing from people who were given like review units of the uh, Apple's new iMac and it's in this really awesome kind of space gray configuration with a Bluetooth keyboard that has a number pad and all that and it's all in slate, you know, space gray as well and then the new uh, Magic Trackpad that's in the exact same color scheme and real fancy and the display is all ridiculously, you know, 5K and whatnot um, and it all just kind of happened at once. Very shortly thereafter, they were available for purchase, probably around mid-late December. Yeah, about three weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, I, I stopped in the Apple Store, I don't know when it was, uh, the Saturday before Christmas, because that's when I saw Star Wars. Nice. Um, and I had some time to kill, so I went to the Apple Store, and they had an iMac Pro sitting there that they got, I think, earlier that day. Now, this was the 8-core version, the you know, the $5,000, the lower spec one. So the cheap one. Yeah. <laughs> the $5,000 inexpensive desktop computer. Yep. Well, when compared to the most expensive top-of-the-line iMac that you can buy, that's not pro, it's not even $1,000 more expensive. Yeah. And you get a lot more from that you know, $800 price jump or something. It's still $5,000. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. 
but yeah, it's a beast of a machine with some uh, great high power. Pro- I think custom Xeon chips. You know, they have ECC memory up to 128 gigabytes of RAM. Got that nice dark aluminum, and that's and the black lightning cable. You cannot forget about that. Oh, that's so yeah. good. So there's no hard drive in there, so their cooling system is much larger and more robust. Um, so it keeps it pretty cool for those higher power CPUs. That's all I can think of for now. I will not be buying one. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I also will absolutely not be buying one. But I believe uh, Cable Sasser, uh, who is uh, one of the folks behind Panic, uh, was, I believe, one of the people to uh, get a review unit. Uh, yeah, sure enough. Here we go. I'll put his thread in the show notes here uh, because it is good, and he is he's a good uh, person to to uh, kind of give you a walkthrough of it. I think he's one of only a couple of developers to get this machine beforehand. Yeah, I know. Like, uh, I think Mark has Brownlee, a uh, big tech reviewer on YouTube. He got an iMac Pro. Uh, I don't remember who else did, but a few other people who have you know high computing needs got some i think you know a week beforehand to try out and they're it was pretty much all good reviews i thought yeah i i mean like this was this this would definitely be the sort of machine that if i i won the bitcoin lottery uh or, or whatnot uh or was like an independent uh contractor and i don't know had to had to buy a machine for like a battle station sort of situation um, I'd probably go for something like that, but um, five thousand dollars, as I think we mentioned, is kind of out of the reasonable range. And this, you know, for performance, that is very much out of the reasonable range for a lot of things. Like if I were a technical designer, right, somebody who was doing a lot of hardcore video work or graphics rendering stuff, um, this would be the Mac for me. But uh, I, I, I do not. So. Yeah. <laughs> if I was compiling things other than JavaScript, I might consider it a little more, but exactly. I don't even know if even compiling JavaScript's enough to merit that monstrosity. I mean Java, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you, you could uh you could always run two electron apps at once. <laughs> oh, wow. Har, what a har, step har. up there. It probably wouldn't even uh wouldn't even blink. Yep. Yeah. I I I think the computer's uh really expensive, but man, those uh Sure, sure, sure is fast, and you know it's uh, makes you wonder what the actual Mac Pro will be like when it comes out sometime, maybe this year or next year. Right, right. Um, one thing we didn't yet mention is that uh, the iMac Pro is vulnerable to Meltdown Inspector. So <laughs> that's true. Uh, your five thousand plus dollar computer is already broken. Well, it's already ten percent slower. <laughs> already 10 percent slower yeah but it, it just it's been out for two weeks so I, I but again i i think we i think we should um explore what like so this computer doesn't answer our desperate cries for good macs um you know my good mac would be a macbook pro that a doesn't cost three thousand dollars for the entry for the model that i want and b right. doesn't come with extraneous features that i don't want right um and C that doesn't come with a keyboard that breaks every other month, <laughs> um, according to Marco. That that happened to you too? No, no, just Marco. Okay. Yeah. So my coworker had his uh, keyboard on his uh, MacBook Pro with Touch Bar break recently. Yeah. So if you're interested in hearing more about the iMac Pro, I'd highly recommend listening to ATP episodes 252 and 253. Uh, they went into a lot of detail about the iMac Pro and what changes and features it has and comparing it to a hypothetical Mac Pro that is to be released probably this year. I can only hope, but even if I hope it won't be affordable at all. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. I wish they had like uh, a Mac mini pro or how about just a Mac mini that isn't ancient. How about that? So like an Intel NUC that runs Mac OS? No, no. I mean like a normal, uh, uh, like a normal computer. That runs OS ten. They they might uh rumor has it I, I'm trying to remember where I saw this. Um but I believe that Craig Federighi said that the uh the Mac Mini isn't dead. Yeah, it isn't dead because they're letting it limp along in life support. They update, you know, every four years, right? Is that the new thing? 
that is the new thing. And by the when it gets updated again, it won't be vulnerable to meltdown. And like the six year old version is more powerful than the four year old version. Oh, that's because criminal. They went went from quad or quad to dual core. So yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, I did put the link to the article from this past October. That's uh, good. Where Tim yeah. Cook said that the Mac Mini isn't dead yet. And he said that um, in an email. Is that right? I believe that is the case. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the of, um, yeah, one of the one of the guys at work, we're working on React Native app, yep. um, and um, he's our QA guy, and so uh, he got a Mac Mini to QA on. Nice. And let me tell you, it, you know, it's probably a, I don't know a nine hundred dollar Mac Mini, yep. but it is slow. It is monstrously. Let's so just, it's just oh, is it so a slow. brand new Mac Mini or is that like a passed well, down I mean, there at the org? I mean, I don't know when it's from, but it's the current generation Mac Mini. That is fair. That is that is. Is a it fair uh, running a solid state or a hard drive? It's it's a hard drive one. That'll play part of it, but yeah, yeah. even then. Well, it's in its dual core, of course, and it's mobile chip dual core, and it is just not a pretty. It's the power of see. what a MacBook Air or something. Um, I don't from know. From that time. I uh, I don't I don't know what's internal in it. But it is, it's so slow compared to my 2013 MacBook Pro. Yeah. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine anybody gets any work done on that. Yeah. I think we've probably kind of talked our way through uh, through the Mac, Mac Pro, iMac Pro, Mac Mini topic. And now we have to talk about something exciting. Now let's talk about something exciting. I'm actually super, <laughs> super psyched about this because you all know how much I love documentation. Right. So bef- before you get into your documentation, let me ask you. Do you use some kind of like wiki like thing to store all of your business documentation and your application documentation, such as your own independent Wikimedia website or your own Confluence or your own uh, GitHub wiki or your your own something or another? Oh, I mean uh, your own SharePoint. <laughs> <laughs> Good old SharePoint. Yeah. Uh, so the the short version is no. Uh, I we recently started a. Uh, a github repository uh not for the purposes of using the wiki but the repository itself contains plain text markdown files oh my gosh um, yep that describe some really uh kind of core things about the way that we do things and um right now it has some really um it, it, it needs some more stuff right um there's a lot of there's a lot of process things that we do that that aren't uh, documented in this repo, but I think over time, uh, more and more of that will kind of uh, get in place. Uh, we're kind of at a busy time uh, at the new year, uh, so um, yeah. But that's that's where that's where I like to put things as things develop. So at my work, we have uh, there's an internal DocuWiki server that runs, um, and there's some general, you know, like the entire enterprise data warehouse team. We have some documentation there about larger, larger things. And we have our own little team wiki, which isn't used tons. Um, some documentation around stored procedures that the backend developers write. And then the application I'm on, our business analyst writes down all the requirements and screenshots and descriptions of how the application works. And so, you know, business logic and pretty much everything. And that is, uh, apparently being linked to for internal documentation on the entire application. So it's kind of becoming our own notes or her own notes to becoming a little more official. So that's just kind of evolved there. Now, I also do have a GitHub wiki on that UI application repository that is just small notes for me mostly, or me and the other developers, mostly around like a list of uh, variables for our analytic software that we're running and just little mapping things and notes of FYI, this is the user ID used for this acceptance test and things like that. Yep. So I, I sort of work for our two businesses simultaneously as the nature of things go. And so Doherty, my actual company, um, typically um, we, we uh, keep all our software and our software notes with the company we're writing for, consulting for, of course. Um, but if we do have some internal software or, you know, some internal process, um, we have two things. 
um, and, and I've already mentioned one of them, uh, which is SharePoint, which is everybody's good friend. Um, and the problem with SharePoint is that there is not a single developer on Earth that will take it seriously. Um, if you put something on SharePoint, it goes there to die. Um, as an alternative to SharePoint, we also have a Confluence um, oh, wiki. Nice. And so I am not the biggest, uh, largest, most enthusiastic Atlassian fan that you will talk to. Um, so I said Atlassian and my Google Home Mini just woke up and said hello. Um, that was fun. <laughs> hey, Siri. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I um, I don't hate Confluence, but it's still not as good um, as I would hope because you can't just write in Markdown you have to fiddle with all sorts of formatting things. It's cool that you can upload files and attachments and you can embed pictures, but um, it doesn't, for me, um, it doesn't feel like a part of my work because I have to go to this strange website and I don't get to kind of just write Markdown, which is sort of like code as far as I'm concerned. Um, I have to write in sort of this rich text environment, which is just so foreign to me now. Totally. Um, it's better than SharePoint, though, of course. So um, about, um, I don't know, about, about a month ago now, I was um, doing some reading on uh, ThoughtWorks. Are you guys familiar with ThoughtWorks? Uh, uh, rings a bell, but I'm yeah. not really sure. So ThoughtWorks is sort of this big um, consulting think tank kind of thingamajig. Um, and, and basically they publish every quarter um, something called uh, the, the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar. And the technology radar is just a bunch of things they've observed around um, the industry, um, you know, what they think is interesting or good, upcoming, what you should stay away from and stuff. It's really cool. And, and, and I was reading through it, and um, it's interesting to look through not the technology section because there's only so many technologies you can um, add to your repertoire in a week. You right. know, every other day there's a new JavaScript framework, right? <laughs> um but it, it's interesting when you start looking at techniques and you, you notice um, a new technique being uh, surfaced to the top. Um, you know, we all know what happened when um, Agile was proposed as a new technique. Um, right. So this is an interesting sort of technical technique, though, and it's called Lightweight Architecture Decision Records. Now, that's a lot of words to boil down to put a structured... Markdown document in a GitHub repo, I mean, in a Git repo, and follow it. And don't change it if it changes. Make a new one. Like, it's 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 super simple when you actually um, sort of read through what it's supposed to be, but it, it cuts down on all of the... Um, where do we put architectural decisions? Um, question marks. Um do you put do you put your architectural decisions in your source control or do you put them in your uh, sort of documentation knowledge base? We'll yeah. put them in your source control because that's where the code is anyway. Uh, treat your decisions like your code, control them, yep. and monitor them and follow them. And you can see if, how they change through version control. And Amazing. if you don't like them, if you don't like them, uh, change them. Just like if you don't like the way that it, that code is, you need to change it. Yeah. Same story. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. So, so this um, this this person, uh, Michael, unpronounceable last name, um, uh, he proposes this very simple format. Uh, so it's a it's a context. So what is the decision? Uh, what is the decision? So after the proposal, like, do we like it? Is there are there uh, you know are there, is there anything bad about it? Um, right. What are the um, consequences of following this proposal? Those consequences could be positive. Or negative, and actually the negative ones should be very much stressed. Um, there's a status section where it's simple. Is it accepted? Or if it does get um, changed in the future, uh, it, it, it could be date stamped with not accepted anymore. Um, and then, of course, in consequences, you'll list of you know what the effect of this is. Yeah. And I think so this is just a wonderful thing to do. I, I cannot... I, I can't believe people store their documentation for their development of code so far away from the code. Yeah. Um, and I guess if, if you feel like you need to have um, SharePoint or Confluence 
or or, or some kind of wikiing service um, involved in the process of your code. Maybe there's too many people not working on the code, but who need to work on the decisions for that code. And that may be a problem. So I can tell you for my, from my experience, I can, I, I bet there would be pushback from um, non-developers on my team or certain developers on my team. Um, so a lot of my, a lot of the work on my team is back in development that is, isn't tracked in GitHub at all. Um, you know, it's stored procedures and things that live on a database server. Now we can store scripts on, um, you know, GitHub or something, and then make sure they're up to date with what's changed in the database server, but it's up to the developers, you know, and if you have people working on that across teams, they have to make sure they update the script when they update the server as well. So there's not only automated deployment to kind of ensure that. So I I could see that being an issue as well as, you know, a business analyst might have a bunch of different projects and they have to go finding all these repositories around. And if you have a user interface repository and API repository for everything, you're going to have logic all over the place and it's, more difficult to define things when they're all so scattered. I agree with all of those points. I will counter them immediately. Um, Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these are archi- architectural decisions, and uh, I, I will stress the difference between application documentation and architectural decision documentation. They're yeah. different things, and they can be in different places. Uh, architectural decisions that have to do with how the code is structured and why we chose to do something this way versus the okay, obvious yeah. other way. That so, can go so in... more for by and for the developers of that application. Precisely. Or that code base. Um, okay. yeah, and, that can, that and, and that can also in, um, include and entertain business-related architectural decisions. So, um, you know, should we use AWS versus Azure? Well, we're going to use Azure because of outstanding business reason number two um because number one was a lie because of meltdown um (laughs) um and then what was the other reason that um you had oh right so um pushback from uh non-technical people um my response to that is why are non-technical people making architectural decisions yeah yeah so yeah i guess my 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 idea there was more around you know application documentation yeah and i think that's specific architecturally i think that's totally fine i would argue that all documentation should be source controlled but that's just my personal opinion based on you know using documentation but i totally understand that normal people have a hard time understanding git and such things um so i'm okay with those things going into some kind of you know more upstream tool but uh code code related documentation should be kept in the code yeah and we have um a coworker of mine before he left the project started you know that standard github contributing.md file oh and that's I've been trying cool. to update that at least with some common practices that we've done not so much specific architectural decisions though yep um it's kind you know it's kind of been you know you know a certain way of uh mocking a service in an angular js component you know we've done it one way then we kind of switched to, you know I, fi- I figured out another way that i kind of like but i never go back and update all the existing things because they right. still function kind yep. of the same i i feel your pain i do that every day of my life so it's you know things like that you know ideally do this but most of it uses this and so it we don't really have a center place of documentation for that kind of stuff yeah, right. and and that and that's kind of the 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 joy of having these little markdown files that tell you like, well, since this period of time we've decided to do it this way. Now, would you put these files in line with your code, or more at like a root level? I would put it um, so like if you kind of think of, uh, I don't know how on GitHub if they have, I guess it'd be like a team. Uh huh. Um, but like I conceptually, there's like a an app a product, and then below that product, there's a bunch of repos that represent you know, different sets of code that all yeah. relate to that product. And to me, it would just be another repo under that product. Okay, so a, a documentation repository, yeah. Or, yeah, that. Yeah, so I would I would probably put, so most of the, the, there's some architectural decisions that I think definitely can span multiple projects, even if it's for the same, uh, you know, same software product. 
uh, it might it might be different software projects in GitHub, right? Um, but I think for so I'm I'm you know as as we've been talking about this, I've been thinking about how I could apply this to something that I'm working on on my own right now, um, and I think I think this would probably be really helpful for anyone else who uh, you know like wants my kind of allocated time on on this particular um kind of internal solo thing is up um if if you know next time somebody needs to make a change to this um i'm not available or or just for resourcing reasons somebody else gets this information i think it would be probably pretty helpful for this but i'd actually probably put it in line uh on this particular project uh, in that same repo that the front end and the back end are in. Yes, this is a an app where the front end and the back end are in the same repo. Blasphemy. <laughs> uh, sort of. When when they're all maintained by a, a extremely small team of developers, by which I mean one point two developers. <laughs> um, uh, I I don't want to have to push and pull my own code. No, I I totally get it. Don't worry. <laughs> And I, I I I heard the same thing from the other person that was working on this too. So <laughs> the other point two of, of the person. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, yeah, yeah. He uh, he left the company. So. Yep. Right. So I think this is a really interesting idea, um, and 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 so the idea in itself isn't actually that interesting. What's interesting is that why doesn't anybody do it? And then also. It's so amusing that ThoughtWorks thought this random blog post from 2011 <laughs> was worth so much attention as to put it in the number one adopt slot um, for the uh, fall 2017 radar edition. No, totally. <laughs> I just thought it was so funny. That is pretty funny. I actually, so this is kind of a, a tangent here. I know we're enforcing a minimum tangent policy from here on out. But, no, no, um, no. That was only in a different show that we didn't do yet. Oh, okay. Well. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. So, Our show is minimum tangent policy. Uh, uh, but that's not this show. Th- this is maximum tangent policy. <laughs> that's right. Uh, well, uh, let, me, uh, l- let me say then that I've used Mingle, which is their uh, kind of jira um or uh task tracking kind of uh product and that thing is uh beautiful and horrendous and yeah ev- everything at once yep. um it's really amazing and really rich and it loads really quickly it's a rails app or so it seems uh maybe it's not a rails app and it just kind of feels like a rails app um apparently it's they they built it and deployed it on serverless you know lambda functions or whatever in 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 aws which is great so proud of them hipster Um, but yeah i know right um but i have to say occasionally like the they, they have all these different like types right there's there's a type for a task a type for a defect a type for a sprint whatever kind of like jira but I despise that model so much. Oh sure, <laughs> because um, everything should just be a card. Oh right? yeah, I don't disagree. Ul- ulti- ultimately, these these things like they they're built into the platform to have such specific, um, such specific uses. Yep. Um, that most of them are extremely useless to me, and that I have to even pick which type of card I'm dealing with before I can pick things like severity and impact, like or severity and priority whatever you want to call it severity and impact is what i would probably call it um that's just like ah it's super super frustrating to me and we had this run one situation where i was i was using it at a certain point where um uh yeah i should i should probably stop talking but uh <laughs> suffice it suffice it to say i had created a project template when i thought i'd created a project um which then made it basically uh you know i'd put so much effort into setting up this thing and then it ceased to function so yeah it's it's fun we should probably cut that part out but um, (laughs) no that's fine uh but no mingle is great and you can do really extreme querying that i've never wanted to do on a on a uh on a platform like that before but you can do it and you can do it really well and really quickly and for that they should be applauded um my maybe yeah, maybe, maybe in the future. I don't know if we've done this already. I feel like we might have, but you know, everything is uh, repeated here um, <laughs> as a tangent. Um, 
but maybe we will talk about in the future our uh, philosophies on um, like Agile and Scrum and Kanban and uh, the nature in which cards are made and cards are never looked at ever again right. because it's a process we must follow and not something that actually matters or is helpful. Right. The The one other thing I'll say to that is I started to, whenever I start working on a card, I will use a physical sheet of legal paper, like a, like a legal pad. Um, yep. To track and you'll write card number done. up on top. Yep. Yep. I used to do that same thing. You're you're going from the uh, virtual simulation of a physical thing to physical. So going back from you know opposite to what like the original Macintosh did, where yeah, digital desktop with a file and yeah. So, so. I re- I actually really like that. Um, when I when I started at Doherty, we we actually I was working on a product um, that had you know dozens hundreds of cards already yep. in the backlog and yep. you know in various states of you know progress and um when i picked up a few um you know they would get resolved and you know i did a, did as well as i could being the the new guy and then a, a month later something would come up again not related to what i worked on um because it was broken or anything but because it was just new functionality or right um some somebody's intersecting functionality wanted to know about something and it was great that i had my uh legal pad of card pages so that i could go back and remember what i was thinking about as i worked on that code exactly exactly i actually just um archived shall we say um all of all of those pages i had from like basically the past year yep um since i started doing this um and it is so a it was so awesome to just like um sort out all that paper and and just uh kind of you know stow it away but it was also so great to be able to look back on that over the past however long um and uh um and and, and be able to revisit those things that, that like to tie it all back around um one of the trickiest things i i you know th- this is really like one of those uh kind of uh, architectural decision records that we were discussing just previously right it's this is the way that i track well okay this 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 might be the the thing i'm 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 tackling in this card this might be the subject of the card but this signals something that we need to rethink about this underlying thing about the way that this application does what what it what it should do or this thing that has all these tendrils into all these other parts of the application that might also need to be rethought or this thing that I think was do- that was done really well, and here's what we're adding on to it to make this even more robust in the future. Um, I think, you know, clearly all those aren't markdown documents, and clearly all, all those aren't shared with other people. And uh, I think you two have both seen my handwriting, so you know that um, it's extremely uh, difficult for non-me people to read my handwriting. Um, Don't so worry, I'm sure mine's worse. It's not. It's not extremely useful for anyone else. I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, However, uh, it has been extremely useful to me and has come in handy. You know, I, I used to, br- you know, bring that legal pad to, you know, meetings with, with, uh, with stakeholders, right? People who um, were kind of, uh, you know, upstream decision makers about the product, uh, project and product. So I could, I could be like, hey, you know, I, we're talking about this right now. And also this is the, this is the reason why this was the way it was. So I don't have to go back through and replay the entire thing through my head. Like, a um, like, a the Redux state replay function in, uh, in the Redux dev tools. Now that is a deep cut of a simile. If I'll ever, uh, if I'll ever make one of those, but, uh, it's, it's really, it's a really solid practice, but I think it's also relate really related to the, ADR pattern that we were just talking about. Yep. Brought it all back around. Woo. You know what time it is? Ah, uh, what time is, is it? it? Is it Twitter time? It's Twitter time. Woohoo. Well, I have some exciting news, you guys. Uh, I broke 3,000 followees. So I follow 3,000 people uh, but, uh, within the past month since we've done uh, PodKit 34. Um, uh, I, I do not have a th- uh, 100 people to talk through with you today because we'd be going on for another six hours about. Um, <laughs> but I do have three really cool people to talk through. Uh, the first is uh, Jonathan Weinberger, who is a security engineer at Snap, uh, formerly at Google. 
Um, I think if I recall correctly, I uh, I started following Jewel during the um, kind of early part of this uh, Spectre and Meltdown sort of fiasco. Um, and uh, he's just a really awesome dude in general. So uh, I'm cool. Uh, definitely would recommend uh, following Jewel. Uh, next up is Scott Rogowski. Uh, who uh, have either of you played uh, HQ Trivia before? Mm-mm. I have not. I've heard about it, but that's all. Uh, so uh, this is really big at work. Uh, basically, they have two games, one at 2 p.m. and one at 8 o'clock. I've never done any of the 8 o'clock games, uh, but there are some folks who I work with who are really, really into this thing. And Scott Rogowski is the ridiculous host of uh, of uh, HQ Trivia. He always comes up with ridiculous names for himself. Right now, his is Quizzy McGuire because he hosts a quiz <laughs> show. Um, and I guess he, he uh, you know, it's entertaining to him. Uh, but, uh, you know, kind of a funny dude. Um, definitely worth a follow. If nothing else, to just keep an eye on the, the weird and wacky uh hq trivia saga they're actually really kind of interesting they do a bunch of stuff with like a real-time video streaming among like half a million clients at once wow um, and, that's yeah. quite the scaling <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and simultaneously too like uh sending like like uh user responses right like uh so when you're playing you push a button on your phone you you, you tap a, a touchable opacity in react native speak and uh and it I immediately like it. sends back to the server your your response um but then you know once time is up once the 10 seconds are up it already has the results tabulated which is uh kind of kind of bonkers when you think about it with you know 500,000 600,000 simultaneous uh users and you know at least that many uh pings going back and forth to some server of unknown uh you know unknown origin unknown design um it's it's kind of a cool thing they've had a couple situations where their uh, systems has kind of uh fallen over um most notably i believe on new year's eve um when they had a kind of a bigger thing for that but it's you know it's interesting to follow and scott will give you a little bit of a uh a window into that uh, and last but not least is this uh bot called metropologyny which generates uh these really awesome kind of uh city maps uh i don't really know how it does this but it looks like it has something to do it, it definitely looks like it's uh um has some sort of procedural uh route that it uses to like maybe creates the buildings first and or creates the roads first and draws buildings that fit between the roads um but it's a really kind of a neat bot. Um, so yeah, that's definitely. really cool to look at. It yeah. looks more uh, European or like older city. I yeah. don't see one that's just straight grid and nothing else. Oh, right. even some, there are even some islands on here. <laughs> yeah, for real. It is really cool. Um, huh. Generative art is really kind of cool, and I want to I want to do that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll uh, definitely trying to keep an eye out for stuff like this, for it is very cool. Yeah, that's cool. I'll also note that, that is... on um, on their Patreon, they have 45 patrons, but somehow they're only making $97. Hmm. It's a well, lot of that's a lot of uh, small, yeah, small donor Patreon. Brian, what's up? Who are who are your followees this month? I followed a few people. I'm up to 485 people who I follow on Twitter, which yeah, is Yeah, you people are crazy. Which is like, you know, at least 35 higher than I would like it to be, but it is what it is. I'll reduce it later. Uh, the first person here is uh, Sarah Drasner, who goes by at Sarah underscore Edo, um, a developer at Microsoft on Vue.js core team. I'm sure someone retweeted a tweet. I've seen tweets of hers come up over a while. I don't yep. know, do some cool JavaScript-y, other tech cool stuff that... Yeah, good follower. Uh, next up is Jonathan Jonathan Levin, also known as Morpheus and a few underscores. He's uh, notably an iOS, macOS hacker 
slash researcher um, has been working on um, a tools called uh, Liberty or Liber iOS and Liber TV for jailbreaking Apple TV on iOS 10 and earlier versions of iOS 11. So that's been kind of interesting to look at. Yeah. Uh, I have not jailbroken. There's still other things like uh, dynamic code injection, which has not been updated yet. Um, and finally, uh, Nadia Bremer, who is a data viz uh, person who tweets out some cool visualization things, which I always like to look at because I've played around with D3 a lot in my day and I am a business intelligence developer. So I do like analytics and things, right which on. is all about data viz. So I have one Twitter follow i I'm I'm very Twitterific. Hey. Hey. Um and so this is Kent Dodds who um posts about React a lot, I guess. And so he um has something to do with front end masters, I guess, somewhere. Yeah, he presented at JSMN like last last uh last October, was it? Maybe September? I'm he like he looks really familiar. Talk. Yeah, he gave a yeah. lightning talk. And so he's he's a really smart guy, and um, he um, also makes videos at Egghead IO, uh, which is a video learning site that I might have signed up to. And I watched his um, advanced React concepts video, and it was actually really informative. Um, I'm generally skeptical of websites with video tutorials that you have to pay for, because if they were good, somebody would have just written about them on their blog. Right. Um, but uh, he knows he knows a bunch of stuff, and it's really good, and uh, he's cool to follow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, he's he's been pretty instrumental in, um, you know, like I, I use Downshift, for example, which is yep. a, a library that he maintains with paypal that uh is kind of one of the flagship libraries to use the render prop pattern which kent is a is a rather large proponent of um and uh downshift is really great for building uh kind of like combo box or or um autocomplete assisted select boxes um in a way that doesn't kind of make your head spin so I'm, i'm i'm a pretty big fan of that actually there might be something there for um ryan some of the validation stuff that you want to do even though i you know because that's that's a lot of the internal component state yep. thing mm-hmm. but i know i, know I would already, love to know more i know you've already examined some of this and i know you don't want to do that thing where um where every input is wrapped in a component um or right uh, yeah but may, maybe there's something there maybe there's something there is what i'm trying to say maybe there's a trick to it maybe there is maybe it's multiple render props <laughs> and and render props oh no <laughs> no yeah no uh tldr i uh heartily endorse uh following kent dodds as well all right where can we find you on the internet or or in real life i guess you can <laughs> find me uh uh on the internet just about anywhere but uh predominantly on twitter where i'm brandon b-r-a-n-d-o-n underscore m-n uh, you can also find me on my website, which is the same thing, but with a dot where the underscore is. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N dot M-N. Uh, or on Strava, where I have that exact same username I have on Twitter. B-R-A-N-D-O-N underscore M-N. And using Strava, you can probably track me to a, to a rather unsettling degree. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> high, high, high five me on, on my way to work. Uh, good, good, good luck. Uh, see you tomorrow. Uh, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at Ranmar, and of course, on my website, com, which is now coded entirely in JavaScript through Gatsby, Ooh, yes. which I will be talking about undoubtedly in full and lengthy detail sometime in the future, perhaps on this show. Can't wait. And you can find me on the internet at uh, Brian Mitch L on Twitter and my website, brianm.me. And uh, I and recently in a YouTube video that I posted, which is my one second every day from 2017. So you can see a lot of stuff that I do and maybe even recognize some familiar faces. That is a really fun video. I, I had a lot of fun watching that. It was cool. 
yeah, it was it was fun to to record throughout the year. It's pretty low effort, <laughs> you know, just a few seconds every day. Truly, truly. And with that, wow. uh, I think we'll we'll uh, talk next month. Truly, cool. we shall. Sounds good. Have a good one. Have a good one. Take care, friends. Knock, knock. Branch prediction. Who's there? <laughs>